Well, we, I mean, we, we just have a, a kind of form. Just Check. How's that sound? That sounds good and loud back there. All right. Ship moving. No, there's one after this. <sighs> okay, everyone, my watch says three o'clock, so let's get uh, things started for this first session after lunch and storytelling. <clears throat> uh, welcome to Corn and Covers. Uh, my name is Stefan Galens with Practical Farmers of Iowa, and we have Will Cannon and Andy Linder with us today speaking on this topic. Uh, like all the sessions that we've had at the conference today and yesterday, this will be a 60-minute session, but the only difference is following this session, we have a 15-minute break and not a 30-minute break. So after this session, get to where you want to be for that final session, and I uh, hope you've been enjoying yourself thus far. Just a few announcements that I have before we uh, get on with the topic at hand. Uh, if you are a CCA, Certified Crop Advisor, up there by Cole in the, the corner there, raising his hand, is the uh, sign-in sheet if you're looking to uh, earn CEU credits. So we can go sign in or scan the QR code to get that. Uh, also, uh, you've probably heard us say this a few times, uh, page 39 of your booklet is the evaluation form. We'd really love for you guys and gals to fill that out. Let us know what you felt, how you thought about the conference. Uh, give us some feedback because we do enjoy reading that and uh, acting on that in the future. And finally, like many of my PFI colleagues have been saying throughout the conference, we do really appreciate you properly wearing your mask, uh, helping us keep everybody uh, safe and cooperating uh, this weekend. Thank you for that. So um, in preparation for this uh, um, session, uh, I was reflecting with Will and Andy that it never fails. Every March or late February, if you're on the Practical Farmers email discussion list, the, the list erupts with discussion about whether or not to plant corn green into a cereal rye, living cereal rye covering crop. It never fails. Like the last three or four years, this question comes up. Questions about the amount of cover crop that one feels comfortable with planting uh, corn into, what the forecasted near-term rainfall and temperatures are going to be, uh, so we've got, we're really happy to have two people here in person to talk about this rather than us chattering on the email list, although that's a lot of fun too. Um, but Will and Andy are going to share with us their personal stories and experiences, and of course we'll have plenty of time with you all to talk about what you've, what you've done or what you're wondering about, and we can enter into good discussion at the end. Each of them have about 15 or 20 minutes of prepared remarks, and that leaves us plenty of time for Q&A. Before we, uh, before we conclude and go on to our next sessions. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Will and then Andy will take over from there. So please welcome Will Cannon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I've been to the, been to, uh, to the conference here for several years, my first time presenting. So I'm excited about this. So 
Uh, we'll just jump in. I've got a picture here of, of uh, some of the covers on our farm a couple years ago. I had everybody situated out in the field planting and I had a moment and I said, I'm gonna take grandpa's old tractor out and look at some cover crops. And about halfway across the field, I said, when's the last time I put gas in this thing? And then about later, I ran out of gas. So, so glass half full, I, I got some kind of cool pictures because the lighting was right, but. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, my family. So my wife, Cassie, there on the left uh, is a, a rock star. I call her a force of nature. Uh, she can get more done in the day than I can get done in the week. Uh, my son, Oliver, there in the middle, uh, just went off to, uh, to uh, three-year-old preschool this fall. So he's excited growing up. And then my little guy, Case. So they're named after the, the tractors that, they're, that their grandpas used to use. So. Uh, and then I've got a brother, Tom, that raises purebred cattle, and we use a lot of covers and forages to help him kind of extend his feed dollar, and so that may come up in the, in the conversation as we go through. So <clears throat> our farm uh, for next spring will be uh, 942 acres corn and soybeans. Uh, we strip till 100% of our, our corn ground, uh, and we no-till 100% of the soybeans. Uh, we've been using cover crops for... Uh, at least 11 years now on 100% of the acres. And uh, we started as early as 15 or 16 years ago uh, with the very first ones. And then on the farm, we do a little bit of custom spraying and a little custom tiling for, for folks as well. So. so on our farm, and like everybody's farm, uh, the cover crops have kind of been a, an evolution for us. Uh, when we started out the very first year, you don't have any equipment, you don't have an idea of really what you're doing. And so we just had it done aerial uh, seeding. Uh, and they actually did it with a helicopter. And that turned out to be a, a complete abysmal <laughs> failure first year out. So uh, I still got some friends that, that tease me from time to time. That first year we flew on, uh, we actually, oddly enough, decided to do it in front of corn. And so we had uh, a cereal rye and um, a radish mix that we went with. And nothing took off at all that fall. And the next spring, I was still working a job off the farm besides farming as well. So that next spring, I'm out no-tilling my corn. Uh, this is even before I had strip-tilled. And I'm no-tilling it, and I'm looking everywhere trying to see if there's anything growing because I'm nervous about this, and nothing's growing. And the reason I was nervous is I knew I had a two-week business trip coming up after I got done with corn planting, and I was going to be away. So I asked the agronomist at the co-op to keep an eye on the field for me. And so when I came back, he had not kept an eye on the field for me because while I was gone, then everything germinated. And so I had uh, rye and radishes starting to grow amongst the corn. And so we sprayed it with, uh, I forget what we even used, but I know it's a, a bleaching herbicide. And so then everything turned white. So then it looked like we had snow drifts in the field. So some of my friends still, still like to tease us about that. But... Uh, but we didn't give up after the first year. Uh, we, uh, I started working with, uh, with another business partner, and we began uh, <clears throat> drilling them. We started with a very inexpensive Great Plains drill that we bought on a, on a wholesale auction and put a little bit of money into. And that actually really worked pretty well. It wasn't the heaviest duty drill in the world, but uh, it started giving us a little bit of confidence. We finally started getting some stands. And so this is just an example in bean stubble where we were drilling it. And on, the, on, our, corn, on our soybean side, we were using a, a vertical till. Uh, we were having the co-op broadcast seed and fertilizer out and then lightly working with a vertical till. If you want to know what quality job your co-op's doing, just throw a cover crop seed in with the fertilizer and you start realizing all the gaps and skips and everything else they leave in the field. So eventually we went to uh, a Velmar seeder on the, on the VT, so our timing was better and, and our application was a lot better. So, um, with the beans, or excuse me, the bean stubble going to corn, uh, we started out, we were putting 50, 55 pounds of cover on, and uh, early on when we were doing that, it seemed like we were getting a little bit moisture, in the, a little bit more moisture and growing in the fall than what we had the last few years, but the problem we started getting into is we were getting a lot of growth um, and so in this field, you can see where we've got strips that we pulled through the cover crop. Um, they're not very big or wide, but they are there. And then you can see what it looks like after we planted. And so this worked for us, but we had a lot of, a lot of hiccups and, and I kind of felt like we were always on the, 
on the bleeding edge of having issues. And so that kind of led us down a, a path uh, as we started evolving a little bit where we've, uh, we've tried, uh, we tried using some other species, trying to get a grass away from a grass. You know, obviously all those types of things that come up in conversation. So we've tried, you know, winter peas, clovers, hairy vetch, a lot of different things. And the problem I seem to run into in, in our corn soybean rotation, um, and I, I, I'm sorry, I should have said, you know, we're located in Prairie City, which is straight east of Des Moines, okay, just south of Interstate 80, a couple of miles. Uh, and, but the problem we still run into with that is even if we plant a really early maturity soybean and get that harvested the second week of September and immediately get it drilled into the ground, we're really only looking at three or maybe four weeks of growing time before our first frost gets there. And so over multiple years, try multiple different species, we could get stuff up, we could get it growing, but we couldn't get it big enough to really survive those frosts reliably, right? It might survive the frost, but then it just was kind of stunted and it wouldn't do a whole lot. And so that really just kind of led us back to the old faithful uh, cereal rye and wheat. And as we go forward, you know, we'll, I'll talk about it here a little bit more. We're, we're still trying to think about ways to get away from that system. But uh, for now, the, the winter wheat and the cereal rye have just worked really, really well for us. So this is kind of what our system looks like today. Um, we've gone away from using the drill and the vertical, uh, the vertical till. Uh, and so <clears throat> this was our second fall this year using this machine we built here. So we're using a, it's a, a, a Hineker air seeder. A Hineker used to sell a, an air seeding bean planter type setup. It's essentially a glorified Gandhi. Some of the parts actually come from Gandhi for it. Um, and so what we've done is we've gone to controlled traffic in our soybean stubble where we're banding the, the rye down in a 15 inch wide strip. Um, and we're leaving it open where the corn row is going to be planted. And then we're able to seed at a 25 pound per acre rate there. But the beauty of it is our density in between the row is actually the equivalent of 50 pounds per acre. So we think we're getting a little bit better weed control that way. We're getting better uh, erosion mitigation and so forth. And we're keeping the rye and the corn away from each other just a little bit, giving ourselves a little more flexibility. Again, what we were doing before with the strips, that was working, but as you can see in that picture, in that picture, <clears throat> that's a pretty tight window, and so if our rye got very big, uh, I just was always really nervous we were gonna have issues where the corn was gonna be shaded and, and cause us issues. So um, with the corn stubble then, we broadcast seed. Um, so we actually let the machine broadcast across the whole machine and we're putting on about 55 pounds per acre. And for us, we're far enough south, the residue doesn't bother us. And so this is kind of like having a Yetter Devastator under the corn head. We broadcast the seed down, the harrow smashes everything flat on the ground uh, and gets, gets the residue over the top of that seed and creates a mulch that the rye seems to grow in really, really well. So the big advantages for us, um, I, we all run into it, right? None of us have enough time uh, manpower, horsepower, anything in the fall. And so this system has helped us speed it up uh, and make us a lot more productive. So uh, with, with this little 120 horse tractor, we could do about 20, 25 acres an hour, and we were burning less than a quarter gallon of diesel. So when I've looked at our covers, you know, I, I talk to guys that are, are thinking about starting, you know, and they start saying, well, you know, if I gotta spend 50 bucks or 75 bucks an acre, for a cover crop, that's really hard to do. And I say, yeah, you know, if you gotta pay for a plane and you gotta pay for 50 or 75 pounds of rye, that gets expensive. But for us, what we've tried to do is really drive down the cost. And so with this whole setup right here, I can, I can put my, I can pay for my cover crop seed and my, my application and everything. And it's only costing me about 10 or 12 bucks an acre on, on soybean stubble where we're going to corn, okay? so. At that point, your risk is pretty low, right? It's not a big, big economic impact. So this system's been low horsepower. Uh, I've got good part-time help that can come out after work. They can jump in that tractor and within three or four hours, they've got everything seeded that we've harvested that day. So we try to stay within 24 hours of the combine every day. Uh, we wanna make sure we maximize every growing degree day that we have 
in the fall. Okay. Uh, so here's a just a, a real short video to to show the machine. So <clears throat> we've got really highly engineered, highly specific pieces of plywood that we've uh, bolted onto the the deflectors of the air tubes. You'll be able to see it as it comes by here. And so we get just that little bit of scratching action seems to get the seed in. We don't have a lot of a lot of tillage or anything like that happening. I mean, I think there's less disturbance in this system here than it would be if we came in with a, a, a seven or a 10 inch spacing drill, right? So uh, for me, I really love low disturbance, low horsepower, high productivity, uh, keeping the keeping the cover crop pretty inexpensive. So. We, we built those deflectors the first year because we were saying we got to get this thing in the field. We got we to gotta get to using it. And then one of the guys that helps me is like, oh, we got to build, you know, we need to do this. And, do, and I'm like, I don't know, man. The plywood takes like five minutes and you can have them on and off. So sometimes the simplest design is the best design. So, so then we come through, uh, obviously a month or two later, depending upon when we did things, and uh, we make our fall strips. And right now we've just been using a, a basic DMI toolbar with anhydrous is what we've been doing for our strips. I'd like to get to something a little bit better here in the future, but that's what the, the budget allows now. And so you can see, you know, the rye that's growing here. Uh, it was kind of a cold day, so the rye is not showing up the best in the picture, but, but we've got this little band of rye then that's just going right on through between our strips. Um, and, uh, and we're all set up to go for spring then. So yeah, it's pretty straightforward on the, on the, on the strips and everything. We've had pretty good luck uh, doing it that way. The, the only thing I'd maybe I'm gonna change on the harrow here in the future is I might need to add coulters so that the harrow doesn't drift quite as much behind the tractor so that, that the, uh, the strips and the, and the rye line up a little bit better on some of the hillsides. But so in the spring then, uh, this is what this looks like. So this is from um, last spring when we're planting corn. So this is, I don't know, April 20th-ish or somewhere in there. Uh, we pretty well got things planted optimally this spring. Um, so this is just a picture out the front of the cab window. Um, and so you can see, because of where the rye is growing, it just naturally left open that window for where we're gonna plant our corn. And so then this is just out the back window. I'm too busy to stop, dang it. We got corn to put in the ground. So <laughs> I just shot pictures out the front and back window. But uh, I, I just, I really like the system where we're not trying to fight the cover crop. We can, we can let the cover crop keep growing and, and stay green and try to get as much growth out of it as we possibly can. So, um, and then our goal typically is within, uh, within a few days of when we plant the corn, uh, I try to like to terminate it. And that starts getting into, you know, you don't know when it'll, when it might rain, you don't, you know, there's all those variables you get so you can't control. And so I like to really try to terminate a day or two behind the planter uh, so that if we get a rain or something like that, the rye is dying down as the, as the corn is germinated and, and getting ready to emerge. So our, our rule of thumb, I'm sure Andy will probably talk about it, is we, we my, our rule of thumb that we use is we either plant brown like I had in that, that slide a few back, or we plant green. We don't plant when it's yellow. Um, one of the first years when we were getting set up with the drill, we got really good growth and we went out and terminated that rye maybe a week before we were gonna plant. And as that rye was dying down, it just kept giving up moisture through the roots. And so every day you'd come out, it was like it had rained a couple tenths of an inch of rain. And so we couldn't go plant the field, you know? And because of all the cover on top, all the biomass above, it wasn't drying out very well. And so uh, it just seems like if you get in those situations, the ground will tend to stay tacky. The residue is rubbery. It doesn't cut and shear and move as easy. Um, but if it's green like that and it's good and crisp, it's easy to cut. And if it's brown, it's easy to cut. It's when it's yellow, it seems to give us trouble. So uh, I really prefer to try to plant it green anymore if I possibly can. 
And so then this is just a, a picture then about what, 10 days later, maybe this last spring. So we got corn starting to come up and our rye down, died down pretty quick, obviously with the, with the warm, dry conditions we had here last spring. But uh, to me, I like to see that where we've got, you know, good cover and residue in between the row and we've got a nice clean strip where the corn was able to come up, so. And we'll get into it here with the with discussion points since I just wanted to show you, you know, this is one of my fields from five, six years ago, how much growth there is uh, in early, or excuse me, in mid, mid April. And then this is a, a field from last spring. And you can just see how much difference there is in biomass, right? And so one of the first things I had to learn when we were planting cover crops in the corn and so forth is you just got to understand you're not going to manage it twice, two years in a row. It's just not going to happen, right? We're, I, I get it. I'm, I'm jealous of it too. We're used to being able to put out product A chemical and expect, you know, B result, right? And when we start dealing with biology, temperature, moisture, growing season, all those things are going to affect it. It's never going to be managed the same way twice. So we'll get into it more, but, but this I'm going to manage much different than this. And so uh, as you guys think through your plans and as we're asking questions here today, you know, start thinking about, well, how big is my rye going to be when I get there? Or making sure you go out and observe your rye when you start asking questions because my first answer will be, it depends. Is it this or is it this? This, I'm going to be a lot more lenient and a lot more relaxed. This, timeliness is going to get really important, right? And so we'll, we'll talk more about it. I think we'll have a good discussion about it as we go through here. So uh, future ideas uh, I'm kicking around right now. I'm really excited to hear Andy's presentation because I'm looking at possibly maybe going to more of a three crop rotation that does allow us to enter some other cover crop species or some other species growing ahead of, of our corn uh, to take that, that cereal rye corn pressure off a little bit. I'm actually wondering if I can get away from some of the strip till possibly with the way we're banding our cover crop now and our controlled traffic. Uh, I think we'll start playing with that a little bit. Uh, I've also thought about debating with can we put in some kind of cool season legumes or broad leaves that we plant in like March and again can we do a controlled traffic and let them grow in between the corn and then the, the camelina I think has some, some possibilities as well. Other things we're going to do, uh, on, the, on the cedar we got set up, it's actually run through GPS and we have a scale underneath the hopper. So we're able to make sure rates are coming out and so forth. And so I think for next year, for sure, we're going to start variable rating our cover crops. So we're in a lot of rolling topography where we might have a thin weathered clay hillside and then a heavy bottom with, you know, creek bottom or something like that. And so your biggest corn grows in the creek bottom, right? And your smallest corn grows up on the hillside. Well, our cereal rye does the exact same thing. And so do I need 15 pounds of rye on the bottom where it's going to get big and grow easily? And I need 40 or 50 pounds up on the hillside. That's kind of what I'm thinking. And so we're, uh, we're kind of playing around with that, but we got that capability built into the, the cedar when we built it. So I think that's something we'll start doing for next year. And then hybrid selection, allowing the, the covers to grow longer. So uh, two or three years ago, we had the sprayer breakdown. And luckily, it happened in a field where um, we've got a hybrid that has really good early season vigor. So the rye, well, actually it was winter wheat, actually grew up and started canopying over the corn. Um, and it did cost us probably 10 or 15 bushel, but I think a lot of hybrids, that might have been a 50 bushel hit. And so what we, what we learned there is there is a difference in terms of how tough are your hybrids, how can they react to some of these things. It's pretty hard to get them to share that kind of information with you, right? But, but I think if we look at some of, some of the early growing season traits of the corn, I think it, uh, it can give us some clues into, is this one that just cannot take any kind of competition at all? Or is this one that you've got a little bit of flexibility in how you're managing your cover crops? So <clears throat> I've got a few hybrids I know don't push it, right? You gotta be, you gotta be on the leading edge. You gotta get your cover crop terminated right away. And then I've got others that I know I can be a little bit more flexible with, so. With that, I'll turn it over to Andy and then we can open up the discussion. All right, thanks, Will. 
uh, he made some good points. I'm going to echo some of what he said as well. Uh, here's where I come from, a couple hours north uh, in Faribault County along the Iowa border. And a little bit about my family and farm. Uh, farming 950 acres with my dad. And we each operate our own land, but collectively practice a lot of the same practices. Uh, we're in a three crop rotation. Primarily that third crop is oats, but we also have the ability to contract with the canning company on peas and sweet corn if we want to. Uh, we started doing <clears throat> the peas a little bit because it was allowing us some grazing opportunities to get on sooner than the oats. And we partner up with a neighbor on equipment. So we co-own planter, tractor, combine, and then that way when we're harvesting or planting, there's more of us there. We got the labor and can get stuff done with the equipment we have. Our livestock on the farm now is uh, just down to some butcher cattle and then the custom grazing that we're doing. We used to have a really diversified farm of laying hens, farrow to finish, some feeder cattle, and with labor and time, that's all gone away. I run a cover crop sales uh, business and custom application with a high clearance sp uh, sprayer that I turn into a seeder. Uh, so I really like using that method for how I'm getting my covers on to get them in early and get them established sooner. Uh, I have nothing against the plane. I just wanted to offer people another way to get it on. I still have had to use the plane myself because there's not, uh, there's not always years that I can get across the field. What we do today on our farm, uh, we've got mostly winter kill mixes ahead of oats or peas. That way uh, it's dying off in the winter. <clears throat> and we no-till all our corn into a green cover. Uh, we've been playing around with strip-till trials since 2017. Uh, because when all of our machinery left the yard, we toyed with the idea of buying a strip-till bar, but with the three crops, we were down to two to 250 acres of corn and couldn't justify owning a strip-till bar, so we've hired it done uh, and always leave some checks. I'll talk about that in a little bit, a uh, little more detail. Uh, No-till on all the beans into rye since 2016, and no-till on our small grain, canning peas, and trying to no-till the sweet corn when we can too. Uh, I put up here low input user because we used to be uh, very heavy on inputs, uh, fertilizer, chemicals, products, you know, in furrow, foliars, all sorts of stuff. And after coming to some events like this and listening to these guys cutting some of that stuff out of their operation and trying to have a better return, uh, we've kind of went that route too. And now we're finding that if we do go try those products again, most of the time they're, uh, they're not paying very well or at all. Uh, so the mixes and the seeds that I've used or sold, uh, my cocktails after my third crop are always very diverse. Uh, as little as six different kinds of seed and as many as eight to 10. Uh, I always got brassicas in there. My favorite are turnip and kale because of high seed counts. And then I always put a grass in, the winter rye, winter trit, uh, sedan grass, and legumes. I plant around with uh, vetch and clover. I need to do this uh, more and focus on that more. Um, I haven't been because a bunch of these farms were grazing afterwards, so I've been focusing more on heavier grass for the grazing. Uh, I'm missing an opportunity, though, to grow that nitrogen and I, I was just having a conversation with Stevan early, earlier today about how much of a benefit we can get out of that red clover, and so I, I need to start <clears throat> pushing that harder. Uh, if it's in soybeans going to corn, this is some of the stuff I've used. Uh, I usually promote winter trit as a really good option because it's a little slower break in dormancy, doesn't grow so rapidly on you in the spring. Uh, I have used winter rye ahead of corn. I usually pair either of those with some oats. Uh, makes for a nice mix. And then just been throwing some other stuff in, trying it and see how we like it. Um, on the winter trit, I didn't, I didn't believe the slower dormancy stuff until one year I got to see it one side of the road to the other because they green up at the same time. But then as the spring progresses, you can see how that rye really takes off. 
Trit's a little more expensive, so you just got to be okay with paying for it if you uh, want the comfort of something that's not going to get away from you as fast as the rye does. This is what that cocktail looks like. Uh, so in November of 18, all the big dead brown stuff is the sedan. Uh, underneath you can still see the brass because they're kind of green. They live for quite a while yet. And then June of 19, that's how fast it disappeared. Uh, we tried to do strip till in that field, uh, but it was freezing up as we were trying to strip. So it was a very, very poorly made strip. Um, but it just goes to show that once you kind of get these fields crank and how fast that stuff can disappear. Beans to corn, uh, like I said, a lot, of, a lot of the acres we're doing or that are getting done are either through my machine or the airplane. And so you can see after the combine's gone, we got a little green tint there. Combine gives the cover crop a little haircut. All of a sudden the sun shines and the cover crop takes off for the fall. Hopefully we get nice long falls to make that stuff grow. Sometimes they're not always that long. <clears throat> um, usually that cover is winter trit and oats. And then because a lot of people are in programs, we're throwing in some kale or turnips. Uh, and then that's what it looks like planting this last spring. Um, we do plant everything green and then terminate after planting. So uh, talk about planter setups a little bit. Um, we get this all the time at these events that, you know, I'm not ready to do this. I don't have a no-till planter. Uh, I always tell guys there isn't such thing as a no-till planter because I have customers that are doing this with plain Jane planters, no special gadgets. They're doing just fine. Uh, the biggest things are is closing the seed trench, getting a consistent seed depth. And like I said, these gadgets are helpful, but not necessary to get started. Uh, I must have N on the planter. I drug my feet on this one for a long time because we were doing in furrow products and fertilizers and I didn't want to have to carry another product, buy more equipment. So I drug my feet on it for a while and was kind of getting burnt on it. And finally we did some trials and figured out, well, we don't need the in furrow anymore. So let's pull that tube and we're going to dribble nitrogen out the back. And that's probably been one of the best planter changes decisions uh, that we've made is having that nitrogen on the planter to help offset anything that your rye or trip might be tying up. What we have now on the planter after doing this for a while and kind of figuring out what we like and don't like is we have <coughs> clean sweep, which was, is the air adjust uh, row cleaner. Uh, STP openers, they're the serrated openers if you've seen them advertised at all. Uh, I really like them for lack of hair pinning. They do a nice job penetrating the soil and opening a seed trench. I picked the zipper closing wheel by Schaefer. There's a ton of them out there. I always tell people try them and find what you like because there's <clears throat> many of them out there and what you might like I might not or what works in your soil may not work in mine. The Nitrogen is a two by zero, so we're dropping it on top. Uh, I went away from broadcasting because I was afraid that too much of that end was getting tied up in <clears throat> the residue that we were blowing it on when we were blowing it on top ahead of corn emerging. And then we did upgrade to hydraulic downforce this last year. Again, not necessary. It's just the changes that we've slowly made over the years that we've been doing this. And so this is what it looked like and like I said what we had when we started in 2016 we went out there with a John Deere planter nothing fancy at all on it just your regular old planter and now that row unit is what we've upgraded to now it all costs a lot of money so that didn't just happen overnight you know it, it takes time I, I get that <clears throat> um, to talk about planning date a strip till, that plant, nitrogen again. Um, does planting date matter? It's a conversation that I've had with a lot of people this winter because in 20 and 21, uh, at least in, for, for us planting, we've had these early springs where we can get out at the end of April, first day of May and plant corn. It's, it's really warm and nice out. And then it turns cold for two to three weeks. Um, 
that extra residue out there kind of has been hurting our corn stand a little bit. So we've been discussing, well, maybe, we, you know, if it's one of them early springs and doesn't look like it's going to get warm after when we think we could go plant, maybe we should put that off a little bit and get a little better corn stand. Because in 18 to 19, <clears throat> when we had to wait till the middle of May because it was raining all the time, uh, then we were doing just fine with corn planting because it was warm, it was wet, uh, we, we had better stands, and so maybe on these early springs uh, we need to be waiting. And one thing that's made me think harder about that is I experimented with some untreated corn this year, and that had to be replanted. That replant corn on the 26th of May did just as well as the corn planted right next to it on either side of it um, planted the 28th of April. So maybe that plant date isn't as important, especially in this kind of system. Um, it could be more important, or I, I've seen it more important in the tillage systems. Those guys get in, get early, get off to a fast start. Uh, what I've kind of noticed in the cover crops and the no-till though, is that we have a little slower start, but we finish longer. Um, like this last fall, people, uh, with it being dry, their corn was drying down and dying, and they were out harvesting dry corn, and ours was still green yet from top to bottom. Uh, strip till. So I, I told you I've been doing some trials. Uh, in the trials we've done, it's been inconclusive whether it's paying for me. Um, I, I come up with a three bushel average over all the years and checks that I've done. I am going to do another trial for 22 just to know. Uh, just to keep trying it, that strip has been, or that trial has been done without fertilizer. So it was uh, just comparing whether the strip itself was paying. Um, and then, like I said, I, I think the amount of residue is mattering more for the success of no-till planting corn, because uh, when I have a lot of residue versus maybe just a bean, uh, bean stubble residue, I can see a difference in, in that corn emergence. Um, so just kind of something to be mindful of. I hope that doesn't sound like I'm scaring you away from this because I still do like it. I'm going to keep doing it too. Uh, at plant nitrogen, like I said, was the best change on our farm. <clears throat> and if anybody's seen Rick Clark's uh, biomass graph that he puts up where he did his clippings and figured out how much fertility was in that biomass on top, it shows why that nitrogen is important because of how much and that rye can take up and how fast it does it. Um, I'm putting on as little as 10 gallons and as much as uh, 20 gallons of 32 and then coming back with a side dress. So more up front is really helpful in these kinds of situations. Talk a little bit about termination. Um, it's helpful if you can terminate in the vegetative stage so that way <coughs> your carbon to nitrogen ratio isn't quite so high and you can get that rye to break down faster for you and release maybe what it's been, what's been tied up in it. And it, it's going to come down to what you're comfortable with. When we first started this, um, we were spray today and plant tomorrow. And uh, now we've gone to spray today and let's, or uh, plant today and let's spray sometime before it comes up. Um, it is traded corn, but I still don't want that corn competing with the rye. Um, I've even had a couple guys tell me that they've played around with spraying after emergence of the corn. It's going to depend a lot on the, the rye in the spring that you have. So this is really a moving target. Uh, and, and like I think Will mentioned, you know, being flexible and what is the situation. <clears throat> so that's what helps drive our decisions. Um, and then, like he said, plant green or crispy brown. I have been fortunate not to have to deal with the raggy mess, but I feel bad for those that do because that's no fun. So if you haven't been doing it, go home and try it. Um, get comfortable with being uncomfortable because this is going to be really weird for people that haven't done it before. Uh, I've, I've gotten new guys into cover cropping and no-tilling and you really got to hold their hand because I've gotten phone calls in the spring, hey, 
this is really weird that I'm planting into this green cover and it's not black. Yes, it'll be okay. Like I said, are you closing the seed trench? Are you getting the seed to where you want it? It'll be all right. A uh, good friend of mine, he says, we don't win or lose, we win or learn. I've made plenty of mistakes doing this. I've learned a lot from those mistakes. And that's why we do stuff like this, is to get together and share those successes and failures so hopefully we can all learn from it and prevent doing them in the future. And if you do something, if you go home and try to plant green, if you go home and try to no-till, make the area count. Do it big enough so if it hurts, it hurts a little bit. And, and you actually make an effort to make it work. Uh, I don't like the guys that go home and try 5, 10 acres because you can let 5, 10 acres fail and not care that much. If you got 30, 40, or a whole 80, then you're going to try to make it work. And that's what we need to do is we, we need to try. Because um, there's too many people sometimes that want it to fail and just give up on it right away to say, well, cover crop didn't work. We don't have to do that again. Um, I also always end my presentations with, okay, why are we going to keep doing this? And I say that I've traded one set of problems for another. This cover crop, when I first learned about it, sounded like this silver bullet, this cool thing. And once you get in it, you find out that no, it's not, but it's a better way of doing it. <clears throat> I still have problems. They're just different. And <clears throat> I really enjoy where the farm is progressing to and the things that we're getting to do and now all the new things that we're hopefully going to get to try after being to conferences like this too. So that's what I had. Um, you want to open it up to questions, discussion? Okay, what do we got? Is, is How many people are already no-tilling or strip-tilling and how about doing it green? Okay, cool. So, <clears throat> it's, uh, I did a presentation once that if you're, to me, if you're already okay with no-tilling, the plant and green part's easy. The, the, the no-tilling was what I had to get past and, and doing a good job planting. So, um, discussion, questions, what do we, what do we have? Yes. Yeah, so is there a way we can non-chemically terminate it? It's uh, a challenge. So, you know, roller crimping is something that gets talked about a lot. But that timing on that can be a big issue. You know, when you plant and when you do it. Um, that's, that's actually one of the reasons that I really want and encourage responsible use of chemical because I don't want to lose that tool. Um, with cover crops and no-till, we've reduced chemical use, so I, I'm glad I can say that. But yeah, with the, with the overwintering covers, it can be a challenge if you want to not use chemical. Uh, I haven't played around with trying to graze it off, but. Yeah, I, I would just add, I think with corn, that's going to be really, really difficult uh, because if you were going to roll or crimp it, you're going to have to let it get a lot bigger and then you're going to start running into that competition issue between the corn and the cover crop. So I, I don't think that would probably work that well. But <clears throat> think about it from a systems approach. Uh, you know, could he use something that maybe is a fall cover that will winter kill that would leave dead residue that might be there in the spring? I mean, that might be an option. Or, you know, like one of the ideas I was that I had up there on the list that I'm kind of kicking around is, is there something you could plant in the spring that wouldn't take off? you know, that would allow the corn to get ahead of it and they can just cohabitat, you know, in the field or something like that. But I, I agree with you. If, if you're trying to terminate a, a cereal crop or something, uh, you know, cereal rye or something like that, I think you're going to have a hard time doing that any other way than, than chemically with corn, at least. Yeah, for sure.
Yeah, the question was uh, using the rolling harrow to knock the residue flat, and if I have trouble with it blowing. Uh, the beauty is you don't. I, I didn't put pictures in there because it wasn't about corn, but um, what it does is it, it smashes that, that stalk and the root ball kind of down flat, and so you get a cracking or a fracturing action in the root ball, but it doesn't dislodge it or knock it loose. So everything stays pinned to the, to the ground. So you don't get the, the blowing the way you do with, with some of the vertical till machines. And so that's another reason I really like it right now is everything's still pinned and, and held to the ground. Yep. That's, um, that's really good to know because I like the vertical till machines for their lack of disturbance, mm -hmm. um, but I hate seeing the corn leaves blown off the guy's farm. Yeah, we, we were in the exact same spot. And my, my problem is, is, you know, we had this big, heavy vertical till machine we were running, right? But we were shallowing it up as much as we possibly could. I mean, we wanted like 80% of the root balls to try to be intact in the ground, mm -hmm. you know? And so we've got this big, expensive vertical till, and all we're doing is trying not to till with it. And so then that's when I started saying, well, is there a better way? And, and like I said, for us, maybe we're just far enough south, but but it seems like that fracturing of the root ball i don't need to necessarily chop that residue up i can keep it intact and it seems like it makes just as consent uh, just as consistent of a mat to be able to plant on in the spring as what the vertical till did before so are you running a chopping corn head uh we we don't have a, a chopping horn corn head right now no. okay that's one thing that i've noticed makes a difference too uh mm -hmm. makes a difference in lots of things one <laughs> cover success um, <clears throat> the chopping head tends to leave more of a mat and you know chops that stuff up really fine and so your rye or whatever you're putting in has a harder time coming up through that uh, and then also makes for a bigger problem with the blowing too so we we also have gone we used to chop when we were doing tillage and then after getting into covers and no-till uh, we went away from chopping corn head Uh, say that again. Like the type or species? Yeah, so the question was what species of cool season uh, legumes, and I'm not an expert on this, but the, the one that intrigues me the most, uh, I learned from Jill Clapperton a few years ago, is, is faba beans, because they actually don't like to be shaded. Um, so if they would work, I know they're kind of expensive and I haven't had a chance to work with them yet, but supposedly as the corn would, would get up and start to create a little bit of a canopy, they will naturally kind of just senesce and, and fall away so they wouldn't compete with the corn crop throughout the whole season. So that one to me seems like right now today without any experience with it, that that would be the gold standard, right? But, but I've kind of wondered about even, you know, like maybe winter peas and uh, you know, there's probably some different clovers and stuff that if they don't get upright, real vertical, that or 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 they're slow to grow, right? They would slow grow slow enough that the corn could be ahead of them. Uh, I think it could it could potentially work, but that's something I haven't really had an opportunity to experiment with it just yet. So the hard part with that is going to be uh, chemicals. It, you know, which which chemicals are you gonna try to use or not use that are gonna affect that? You know, a lot of the pre-emerges are gonna hurt anything that you're trying to put out there. And then you're also trying to manage what, what's gonna emerge for weeds as well. Um, we didn't talk about it at all, but the idea of V4 seeding uh, is kind of on the same level in that you're trying to manage weeds, chemical, and cover all at the same time, and it gets really hard to do. Uh, which is why I've stuck to the fall seeding and then managing that going forward in the spring with the species and the covers that I pick. I highly encourage people um, to do trials with in-furl. 
um, because a lot of times what happens is you see a visual and I, and I used to see it too right like well the corn's bigger it's greener that in furrow did something but if we actually took the combine to it it wasn't doing anything or very little um, <clears throat> to expand on my in furrow experience we used to use 1034-0 graduated from 1034-0 to a lower salt higher quality and then and then went even past that to a better quality starter and started dumping in micros and zinc and this was when I said we were using high inputs you know so at, at one point in time uh, I had a 40 to 50 dollar an acre in furrow bill and you accidentally forget to turn the pump back on you you know didn't flip the valve whatever and all of a sudden you start leaving these checks and so we purposely started keeping track of those and, and tracking them to see what this 40 bucks was doing for us and we were only coming up with two to three bushel um, so that's when we said well we know we want the nitrogen we're not getting anything out of this starter so let's pull it um, I've I've ran into folks though that really do need it. Uh, primarily one guy is a high pH soil and he said on that high pH, his phosphorus gets tied up for so long that he does find a lot of benefit to inferral. But I just encourage guys to check it because it, especially where I'm at, it's a, getting to be a little bit less common practice, but it was a really common practice that you do this inferral and people were just sold on it and I said well you got it you got to be checking this because you're spending money and we really wanted to do the nitrogen uh, but didn't want to carry the products and and even still today you know there's all these goodies of carbons and sugars and stuff that you know you can put in furrow but we aren't able to do that because we made the decision that the 32 percent is way more valuable that help yeah, yeah. The, the other thing I would add is, is um, oh, I can't think of the, the Farm Journal agronomist over in Illinois. I'm blanking on his name now. There you go, Ken Ferry. I listened to a presentation he did here, I thought it was maybe two years ago, maybe three. I'm getting old now. Um, anyways, uh, he was in that position of this cover crop thing isn't going to work. You know, let's just prove it wrong, right? And so. Uh, he had put out all these plots and, and was going to prove to his clients, no, this is stupid, quit using the cover crops. But what you could tell is he learned throughout it that they were actually kind of working. But what was really interesting in his data, to your point on the inferro, is he was showing where uh, soluble phosphorus available to the crop went up tremendously with, with the cereal rye cover crop. That that cereal rye is mining that and bringing it up and, and, and leaving more phosphorus in the upper profile and leaving it in an organic pea form that's much more available to the corn crop. So for all the things, all the risks we've talked about we may need to mitigate with, with, with uh, cereal cover crops, one of the advantages may be that we have a lot more phosphorus available earlier in the season um, that would kind of help, you know, that would lend, mm -hmm. lend to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. we, we actually had starter fertilizer on the planter that was in one of my pictures kind of early on <clears throat> and, and when we switched from that planter, we actually didn't bother to put another one on the next one because we, we didn't really see that big of a difference either. Uh, same kind of thing. It's more, it seems like it's more about the nitrogen than it is anything else. The way it was explained to me one time about why we see this visual with the inferral but never the uh, yield benefit is that when you put that, that fertilizer in furrow, that corn plant early on doesn't have to work at you know assimilations with the soil and the biology it feeds off of that fertilizer so early on it's lazy and then later it needs to try and catch up when that stuff has run out or been tied up and so now that's when it gets by you might say behind or falls behind the stuff that didn't have it is kind of how it was explained to me what else yeah Yeah, um, P and K. So I, when I said I was going low input use, um, is when I quit using P and K fertilizer uh, and just use nitrogen. 
So I've done that for four or five years now and been watching soil tests because um, I've listened to some of these uh, big name cover croppers once in a while talk about, we don't use fertilizer. So all right, I'm gonna go home and try that. And I did. And four or five years into it, um, I'm still not sure what to think of it because I've seen a soil test level come down, but we just had a really long conversation at lunch today about, well, what value does that soil test have for what we're doing? You know, that soil test was designed for the conventional guy way back years ago. Uh, so I've since decided that to hedge my bets, I'm going to apply a little bit of fertilizer, preferably in the form of manure, that if it's chicken litter, it gets broadcasted on top. If it's um, hog manure, I'm gonna try a low disturbance, get somebody in with a low disturbance injection uh, and just put some fertility out there. But I don't follow the crop removal standards or you know whatever other kind of excuses that we get sold on fertilizer. So I'm gonna keep going that direction and see where it heads. I, I'm, I'm gonna take a five, 10 acre block though and skip the manure and just keep track of what happens to the productivity of that farm if we don't put any fertilizer on other than some nitrogen. Um, if, if you're a, a person, and, and, and we don't need to all go home and cut out P and K, that's not what I'm saying, um, but broadcast is okay, or in the strip. Uh, and if you don't do the strip, I, I'm comfortable with broadcast. Uh, and what helps me believe in that is I have a neighbor that's a strip tiller at home, and he had a good friend from college that was doing no-till beans and, and fall in hydras for corn, and then a spring field cultivator pass with broadcast P and K. And this guy felt like he was maybe missing out on something from laying all that stuff on top for so many years. Um, so he went out and bought a fancy strip till bar, and he started leaving some checks. And he found out that this, the banded fertilizer wasn't helping him over his uh, broadcast. So it, it, maybe it's a, Maybe it's a situation that you need to work into and then that once that cycle starts going and the covers are doing their thing and everything just kind of starts to work out. It, it, there's so many unanswered questions and uh, there isn't a test out there that's going to help us yet either or at least one that I've been confident in. So it's a, that's, a, that's a really good topic of conversation that comes up quite frequently is fertility. I, have you cut back on fertilizer at all since doing strips or covers or? Yeah, I, I was gonna say, I think that's the, the big thing. Like with our strip till, we're down to the point where we're putting on like a quarter of, or, or maybe half of, of recommended P rates based upon, you know, yield goals and so forth. We're, and, and we're not seeing P levels drop off or anything. So I, to me, well, every situation is going to be different, right? If you're if you're David Hula out in Virginia and what he's trying to do, right? He has no fertility in his soil, so to band it and do it in high concentration, he's got to do something like that. But what we're seeing is is rather than just broadcasting it and having a, a horrible efficiency rate at where that fertility ends up, right? And whether the plant can ever get to it, if we band it where we're going to use it, then we're able to cut way back on rates. Potassium, I've cut back in places. It kind of seems like that's maybe one of those that if you are trying to push the yields, we kind of have left it where it would be in a broadcast rate, but it just depends. And it also depends upon like what, what's the productivity of your soil. <clears throat> mm -hmm. For myself, I have almost no family ground, so I've rented almost all of my ground. So I've got some farms that are pretty darn weathered and, and were not well maintained, right? And so I can go in and use a quarter or half P rate and maybe a full uh, K rate and get just as good or better county yields than the guy, you know, two miles down the road that's sitting on a 95 CSR soil with a real high fertility rate. So sometimes some of those parts, I don't, I don't think necessarily about raising yields, but it's just, can we pull our inputs down? And then to your point on the, on the, on the soil health, I think one of the things that makes sense is as we are using more cover crops, as we get more biology going in our soil, 
we're starting to get more, more nutrient cycling of what we're already using, but we're also getting more mineralization of what is deeper in the soil profile right. as well. Um, and that can only happen with more biology because you need biology to be producing the chemistry that will help, you know, bring that nutrient eventually into the soil solution where the crop can use it. So I, I agree on that part as we're using more cover crops and we're building more organic matter and more biology in the soil, we're just priming the pump where we're actually mining more of those nutrients for ourselves in the soil, both in the crop and in the biology. Yeah, time for one more. You want to start, Will? Sure. Um, so right now, the plan is glyphosate. <laughs> um, I, you know, so far my supplier is saying it's available. Uh, if that's not available, then then it's going to be uh, clefidum most likely. Um, I will, you know, we'll we'll see here when we when we start getting product in the shed. But we're going to be very proactive about getting product to the shed, right? So that we know. We, we have what we need. Um, and then <laughs> my, my chemical guy and I were talking about this. There was a, an interesting podcast I listened to with a soil health guy where he was talking about how to use less Roundup. And so he was talking about needing to pull pH down further on the water and some other things. I need to go back and listen to it again. But I, I honestly, I'm probably going to go out and take 20 or 30 acres and try to terminate it on the 1st of April using his method which in theory should take a lot less Roundup. And so I have enough time, right, to be able to watch and observe. So I'm really kind of curious to see, um, see if some of that stuff works that he talked about in there. But um, so that's what we're gonna do. And then uh, the, what was the question about 32? So my, my experience with, with 32, so early on we, we were putting 32 in with the Roundup when we went out to do it. We've actually pulled that out. We don't do that anymore. It seemed to me like the 32 was, was kind of burning the cereal rye and was slowing down how quickly uh, the Roundup was taken up by it, just our experience. And so we actually went away from that where, we, where it's just water we you know we're conditioning our water and then you know adding our glyphosate and anything else that we might add and leaving the 32 and getting that put on the field in a different way that's really interesting because i saw the opposite um <laughs> so i used to uh <clears throat> i used to run 10 12 gallons of 32 with roundup and and it fried it real fast um never used more than 15 probably uh, and a quick comment on Roundup and usage is please don't overuse it. Uh, I have successfully killed every cover crop I've intentionally tried to with the regular labeled rate. Uh, some of the agronomists and chemical guys will tell you that you got to use X number of ounces and um, I've always done it with what just the one X rate of whatever product you're using because they're all all different rates. But do you have any rules for yourself on on what, conditions when you'll go? Do weather it? is huge. Um, it needs to be warm the day you're spraying, sun shining, and warm for a couple days after. Yep. Yeah, same thing for me. I mean, I just wait for the right temperatures, and I I never put more than a more than a quart on. Um, again, sometimes I'll be down to sixteen or twenty ounces, but. Yep. Like you said, are, do we have sun? Do we have heat? You know, what do the next couple of days look like? That affects how much, how much you need. Yep. Okay. Good. Thanks, guys. Let's hear it for Will and Andy. This is a great session. And we've come to our final session. You got 15 minute break to get to where you want to be for the final.